So in this video, I'm going to talk you through how I process International Space Station transits of the sun and the moon. And the first time I ever did this, I was so excited. And even now, having done a few of them, it's still a, a really exciting thing to do. So if you haven't seen my vlogs where I've um, taken you through the experience of actually doing this, and I'll link those in the description box below. So once you go to transitfinder.com, you can set a latitude and longitude for your location and also the time frame that you're wanting to look for transit. So here I've got from the 21st of um, March for four weeks to see what's, um, what's visible there. Also, you can decide how far you're willing to travel in order to view one of these transits. At the time of recording and at the time I captured the transit I'm going to take you through today, um, that was done on the 22nd of March and we were still in lockdown down here in the UK so I wasn't able to travel to see it but fortunately I lived very close to the centre line of where that actually happened but you can put in a, a distance there so under normal circumstances you can drive a little way if you want to try and find the location and when it pulls these up you'll, you'll see that there can be quite a few uh, very close passes so maybe if you drove a bit of a distance you'd get a transit from there but here is the one that I captured the other day it was the 22nd of March and it transit began at um, eight minutes past eight and 50 seconds. Now the entire transit only took like 0.6 seconds from start to finish so the station is moving very very quickly so these timings are very important because if you are even one second late starting the video capture you're going to miss it but this information here is really useful to you on this occasion the space station was actually illuminated so it was very easy for me to see when it was approaching the moon and knowing when to start the capture but quite often these are in shadow when they occur so you don't have any warning you've just got to rely on this being correct so I'll talk about how to make sure you don't miss it in a second but if you want to have a look on a map this is a really useful tool as well and you can see here that this is the centre line and we I live very close to that centre line so fortunately I was able to get a good transit the other day but you can see if you go even just kind of a few kilometres north or south of that line you don't get to see the transit it will be a near miss but you won't actually get to see it so that's how I find out whether there are any transits so it's a good idea once a week to just refresh that page and have a look and see if there's anything happening and just make sure that you are you know, in the right place at the right time. So now I'm going to just take you through the steps that I followed when um, I capture a space station transit. Uh, with all sorts of astrophotography, there are multiple ways of achieving the same thing. I've tried to keep this method as simple as possible. Um, I only have basic equipment and I don't have super duper fancy processing software. So this is how I've got started and I'm going to just show you some of the ways that you can process this in a, a simpler way as possible. So sometimes you'll get the space station transiting the moon, sometimes you'll get it transiting the sun. Sometimes it will be in shadow, sometimes it will be illuminated, as I said before. If the pass is illuminated, then that's great because you can get a fair warning that it's um, going to cross the moon. But during the day when you get one transiting the sun, you don't get any warning at all. The space station is completely invisible during daylight. So you have to rely on the, the information from Transit Finder being correct. So when you do that, make sure that you're very accurate with where you put the pin on the map, because that may be the difference between you missing it and not missing it. And obviously it goes without saying, if there is a transit of the sun please don't attempt to capture that unless you have correct solar filters in place and if you do have a solar filter on the front of the telescope keep the finder scope covered because even the magnification on that small finder scope is enough to permanently damage your eyes so don't attempt that unless you have the proper filtration in place. I actually really like space station transits of the sun because you get the shadow of them so there's the silhouette of the space station and quite often you can see it's positioned slightly shift as it crosses the disc which is really fun but this picture here at the top is the one that I caught on the 22nd of March and the space station was very brightly illuminated during that pass. So 
this is the transit that I caught on the 22nd of March and you can see that, as I just said that this is fully illuminated and as it crossed the moon it's fully illuminated as well and you can see that in the close-up shots here. When I caught this one on the 29th of January it was much fainter but when you get up close you can see that there was a silhouette when it crossed the disk of the moon so sometimes it can go from slightly illuminated into silhouette and then illuminated again as it comes off the other side Sometimes you may get a transit where it's not illuminated at all, so it will just be fully in silhouette. So everyone is slightly different from that point of view, but the, the basic process that I follow is the same. This was the 6th of June solar transit, and this is probably my favourite one that I've ever captured, and you can really see the shape of the, the space station there, but fully in silhouette against the background of the sun. For this, um, it was still the William Optics 70mm refractor, but I had a solar filter in place. Now, it, in order to capture this, you're going to need a camera that has a decent frame rate. And I just use the ASI 120 camera and I put the, the nose piece on it. And you can put a Barlow in the imaging train if you want to. But bear in mind, depending on the size of your telescope, that's going to zoom you in quite a lot. So you need to make sure that you're pointing very accurately. Otherwise, you may just miss the transit. It may just kind of clip the top or the bottom of your field of view. Um, I kind of played it safe on the 22nd and I just did it straight through the telescope with no Barlow so what you see on those pictures is as much of the moon as you can get in it doesn't quite get the whole disc the top and bottom are chopped a little bit but I just used this um, camera on the 70 mil refractor and I use sharp cap to capture the video and the crucial thing here is because as you just saw the entire transit takes just over half a second so you want the frame rate of whatever you're videoing this with to be as high as possible so in sharp cap I always set the frame rate limit to maximum when I'm doing this you don't need a planetary imaging camera you can do it with a digital SLR in video mode but just make sure you've got the frame rate as high as it will possibly go. Once you're pointing at the moon, I always set up super early so everything's aligned and the focus is absolutely spot on because if the focus is off, the space station's not going to be in focus either. Once I'm happy with the focus, I set the exposure so that it's appropriate for whatever the moon phase is. So if it's quite a bright moon then you want to make sure you're not overexposing the disc also with the sun make sure you're not overexposing that as well it's great if you have some sunspots in shot as well but I, I haven't managed to capture a transit with any sunspots in view but basically just make sure that the disc of whatever the space station is crossing is actually focused and exposed correctly now when it does transit sometimes as you just saw the space station will be white because it's a illuminated other times it will be in shadow but as long as the exposure is correct for the whatever phase of the moon is then you should be okay. Now you saw the on the transit finder website that it gives you a very very specific time for the, the beginning of the transit. Now if it's illuminated you can watch it coming over and that's what I did the other night. I could see it head over Orion and as it rapidly approached the moon I just started early anyway because you don't want to go to all this trouble and then find that you've missed the transit because there was a delay on your computer or it, it was a bit sluggish getting going in recording the video so even if I can see the space station I always start the recording around about 30 to 40 seconds early that gives you a lot of frames that you're not going to do anything with but it's really useful to just make sure that you capture early enough because you really would be so devastated if there's suddenly a windows update kicks in and there's a delay and you watch the space station go across the disk and you haven't got anything recorded so start early and i tend to set the capture limit to an unlimited video that way i can stop it as soon as i've seen the transit otherwise you can set it to a 2000 or a 4000 frame video but my fear doing that is that maybe something's changed about the audio bit and it's late getting started and then the video stops halfway through it's just paranoia it doesn't really happen but it, it, I just like to err on the side of caution so start the video early and keep it unlimited soon as you've seen the transit happen just press stop 
So once you've got the video, this is the video played at full speed a couple of times. So it's very, very fast. And then at half speed, still going pretty fast. And then this is at an eighth speed. And you can see that there are quite a few frames that have the space station in them. Actually, there were 29 frames that had the space station in on this occasion. And you can see that th that was the stacked image. So I'm going to take you through the steps that I follow in order to achieve that. So the first thing you need to do is to extract those individual frames. And I've shown you how to do this before with regards to microscopy pictures, but I'll just show you again. So here we are in PIP. I've just drag and drop the video file into PIP there. And in the input options, um, just I've left everything as default essentially. In the processing options, again, just left everything as default. Quality, I didn't want to do any quality analysis, so don't do anything in that tab either. So this is super easy. In this one, you want to make sure that you're playing the frames in forward order so that you can scroll through and find the ones that have the space station in in the right order. In the output options here, you want to choose TIFF and that will extract all the individual frames and save them all as TIFF files for you. And it will do that in a subdirectory one level above where your data is. And if you go to do processing, you can see that there are 1,339 frames in this video. Of them, only 29 had the space station in, but that's fine. You can delete all the others. So then you just do start processing and it will then extract all of those individual frames. So once you've done that, you just scroll through. I use Faststone Image Viewer to just scroll through the pictures and you can find out which frames actually have the space station in them. So you, once you've done that, you can take those frames into a piece of software to stack them together. I actually find Star Stacks is really good for doing this because it's a lot easier to use than uh, using Photoshop, for example. You can, of course, use Photoshop, but I, I really like Star Stacks. I think it does a really good job and it's very, very simple to use. Now, normally I would use Star Stacks for creating star trails, but it works really well here. So the frames that had the space station in the first frame that had it in there is number 427 out of that um, data set and there were 29 frames and they're all listed here. Now normally if you're doing star trails you would have gap filling over here but if you use lighten and then just press stack you can see that it just stacks them all together really really quickly really simply no need for doing any kind of blending or layer masks and it works really really well. When I photograph the space station transiting the sun, I find that darken works better because the space station is in silhouette. But this is so quick to do that you can just experiment, you can do lighten, you can try darken, just try the different modes that StarStax has and see how they turn out. And you can see how quickly it did that. It was so much easier than trying to do something like this in Photoshop. So this is such a useful piece of software. It's free of charge and StarStax will run on Linux. There's a version for Mac as well and it will work on Windows. So it's a really versatile program and one that I use a lot. So once you've got those frames stacked, you can then go on and just process them in whichever way you prefer. I like processing in Lightroom and you can carry on and you can sharpen them. I use Focus Magic for that. But whatever is your kind of imaging processing software of preference is definitely what you can do this with. Now, this is the, the stacked data with a little bit of tweaking, and you can see that it's quite noisy and grainy. I don't normally do this, but what I did on this occasion is I then took the, the video that was kind of nearly 1400 frames long, and I actually just stacked those using AutoStacker the way that I would normally stack a lunar image. And then I blended the stacked image of the moon in with this frame here using a layer mask in Photoshop. And what I got then was a slightly better version of the moon. As I say, normally I'm happy with it just as it is. But on this occasion, I just took that extra step because I thought it was worth doing.
So I think this gave a better result and I really loved when I cropped this how you could see the space station just going over um, Copernicus that was just starting to have the sun rise over it. So yep, yeah, it's still fairly grainy but bear in mind this is a small refractor that did this and there was no Barlow in the imaging train. So it was a you know pretty decent result. It was all shot through thin cloud as well. So it was never going to be the crisp result that I had in my head when I started it. But for some very simple steps, PIP is free of charge, um, sharp cap, you can get a basic version free of charge, and star stacks is free of charge as well. So the and actually you can do a lot of the processing using Faststone, which is also free of charge. So they're all really good pieces of software that are free to use. And this is a simple process that you can follow. Now, yes, of course, if you have Photoshop and if you have PixInsight and Lightroom and some of the other fancier image editing softwares, you can totally use those. But this is just me wanting to show you the very basics of it, of how I first figured out how best to capture this and how to process the image. Images. So I will put links to Starstacks and PIP and all of those things down in the description box. So you can go on and download those if you want to. So I hope you found this helpful. If you do have a go, let me know. Tag me on social media and show me your pictures. And don't, and don't forget as well, if you are going to try this across the sun, please make sure that you're following all the correct safety procedures because you don't want to damage your camera or your eyes. I will see you all in my next video. Bye for now.